Good morning. That's my Rupp Arena voice. It sounds good, doesn't it? Now shooting to Eddie Coffee. Not oh, bad, huh? We're thrilled to see you here this morning. Thank you for braving the elements. I know it's been a tough week for a lot of us, uh, but we're thrilled to have you here this morning, and we're going to have a great time in the house of the Lord this morning. Let's stand together. We're going to rock it out with power and the blood. Here we go. All right, here we go. Would you be free from the burden of sin? There's power in the blood, power in the blood. Would you or evil a victory win? There's wonderful power in the blood. Would you be wider, much wider than snow? There's power in the blood, power in the blood. Are lost in its life giving flow. There's wonderful power in the blood. There is power, power, wonder working power in the blood of the land. There is power, power, wonder working power in the precious blood of the land. Right, here we go. Would you do service for Jesus your King? Would you do service for Jesus your King? There's power in the blood, power in the blood. Would you live daily His praises to sing? There's wonderful power in the blood. There is power, power, wonder working power in the blood of the Lamb. There is power. In the precious blood of the Lamb. Power, power, wonder working power in the blood of the Lamb. There is power, power, wonder working power in the precious blood of the Lamb. All right, church, here we go. Lord, how we need your power every day and every hour. Lord, how we need your power every day and every hour. Lord, how we need your power every day and every hour. Lord, how we need your power, power, wonder working power in the blood of the Lamb. There is power, power, wonder working power. In the precious blood of the Lamb, in the precious blood of the Lamb, in the precious blood of the Lamb. Woo! You may be seated. Psalm 25, starting in verse 1, says, Lord, I appeal to you. My God, I trust in you. Do not let me be disgraced. Do not let my enemies gloat over me. No one who waits for you will be disgraced. Those who act treacherously without cause will be disgraced. Make your ways known to me, Lord. Teach me your paths. Guide me in your truth and teach me, for you are the God of my salvation. I wait for you all day long. Remember, Lord, your compassion and your faithful love, for they've existed from antiquity. Do not remember the sins of my youth or my acts of rebellion. In keeping with your faithful love, remember me because of your goodness, Lord. The Lord is good and upright, and therefore he shows sinners the way. He leads the humble in what is right and teaches them his way. All the Lord's ways show faithful love and truth. To those who keep his covenant and decrees. Let's go, Lord, in prayer this morning. Lord God, we appeal to you this morning. We come before you as the one who loves us, who shows us that love, that truth, that is good and upright. Lord, you are everything 
beautiful and perfect in this world. Show us more of you today. Show us your way. Show us how to walk in your way today. Show us how to live in your way today. Show us how to worship today. And Lord, don't remember our sins. Don't remember our rebellion. We are so prone to wander off the path. I pray this morning, Lord God, that you would keep us on the path. Forgetting our past and running forward toward glory with you. Pray that any distractions that may be looming in our mind, any notifications that may be dinging on our devices, Lord, still them all and train our focus only on you this morning. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, good morning, 11 o'clock. Good to see all y'all in the house today. And hello out there, Facebook world and radio world. Good to have y'all with us as well. For those who don't know, my name is Brian. I'm a pastor here at Hyattsville Baptist Church. We are a church that, among many things, encourages everybody to participate in the work of the kingdom. We are not about just a select few doing some stuff and everybody else riding along. We believe that there are no excuses and no limits to what every person in this church can do for the kingdom of God. Amen? And so, if you're a guest with us today, you're not acquainted with us, we're particularly glad that you're here. There's a couple ways you can get plugged into being a part of Hyattsville Baptist Church. One of those is our connection card, which if you look at our handy dandy bulletin, it's right here perforated for you and ready to just rip it off and drop it in the offering boxes at the back of the worship center. If you're listening online or on the radio, there's ways you can connect as well. Go to our website, HyattsvilleBaptistChurch.com. Go to that connect tab. There's a little spot there where you can fill in your information. Clickety-clack, hit that send button, and it'll come over to us. Or... If you're on Facebook specifically, slide up in our DMs today. Hit us with a comment. Our virtual greeter, Brittany, is on there. Say hello to her. She would love to connect with you this morning. We also, just a reminder, have our kids' bulletins available every Sunday to help your kiddos track with our worship service. Uh, We usually try to tie it in with the exact scripture or at least a parallel one to what we're going to be studying in God's Word this morning. And so those are available. If you didn't get one today, be sure to grab that out of the main lobby back there uh, and get you some crayons. Although I saw that earlier, Dan, you may not believe this. Somebody picked out the yellow crayon and left it in the box and only took the blue and the red. I don't know what happened. It's crazy. It doesn't like yellow. We'll find them. (laughs) Oh, we like to have fun around here, too. If you are not into having fun at church, we probably ain't a good fit for you. Good luck. So uh, we're going to continue on having fun and worshiping the Lord today. And with that, Dan is going to come on back up. Leave that, leave that uh, slide up there, uh, Daniel. Evidently, they don't believe in community. They believe in worship and missions, but maybe not so much community. I'm not really sure. Obviously, I'm going to have to get a new uh, computer because mine doesn't go clickety-clack when I hit the button. If it does, then I'm worried about it. So anyway, let's stand up. We're going to worship together. We're going to do our fellowship hymn. Let's give everybody a high five, fist bump, whatever it is as we sing. He keeps me singing. Here we go.
reign with him on high. Jesus, 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 sweetest name I know, fills my every longing, keeps me singing as I go. Amen. That's good singing. Let's continue our worship this morning with Take My Life, I Am Yours. Take my life and let it be consecrated, Lord, to Thee. Take my moments and my days, let them flow in ceaseless praise. Take my hands and let them move at the impulse of thy love. Take my feet and let them be swift and beautiful for thee. Swift and I am yours. 
couple different announcements just to, as we continue to worship today. Before we get into that, uh, I do want to give a quick shout out to some of our guys who this morning were out in the parking lot in the cold. They've actually been up here a couple times through the week as well trying to get things salted off and get it able to where we're able to have church today. And so can we just real quick give a round of applause for those who have helped in the parking lot today. See, I didn't start with the pandemic today. Change of pace. But along those lines, the pandemic response plan phase is phase two right now. So we are uh, currently, obviously, meeting on Sunday mornings. And ordinarily, we would be on Sunday night right now. However, with the snow in the parking lot and with the the dark tonight probably making it a little colder and icing up a few things. It'll be even more treacherous this evening. So we're going to hop on Facebook Live for tonight, but we are in phase two. So we are gradually moving towards a, a more quote-unquote normal approach to our ministry schedule. Uh, along with that, just a little point of reference. If you have not looked at the KY COVID website here recently where they show the map of how the cases in Kentucky, uh, that is the least read. I've seen that map in a long, long time. Uh, we are slowly but surely working our way through this pandemic. Um, so continue doing what you're doing, continue being safe and healthy, and let's keep praying for the Lord to lift this scourge from our land so we can move on and be done with the number 19 forever, I believe, is how that works. So as such, Tonight's uh, evangelism training, our three circles of evangelism, will be on Facebook Live. We'll do it again in person sometime very soon. For those who don't have Facebook, you know, maybe you're listening on the radio, you don't have means to watch it on Facebook Live. We'll do it again in person here very soon. But this is going to be an opportunity tonight at 6 on Facebook for you to learn how to share your faith. Because here at High School Baptist Church, our purpose is to love God, love people, and make disciples. And someone can't be a disciple of Christ if they don't know Christ to begin with. And therefore, we as Christians have the obligation to share our faith with other people. This time tonight at 6 o'clock will be a way to teach you how to do that. If you're maybe unsure how to work your way through the gospel and bring someone to a point of response, that is what tonight is all about. I hope you'll tune in for that this evening. But we don't just believe in going in missions. It's, it's a bigger thing than that. We believe as a Great Commission church that we are to go, but also to pray and to give. And so on the praying front, I want to tell you a, a story today about Victor and Madeline Hawthorne. They are some of our IMB missionaries in the nation of Thailand. Uh, you may, if you grab your prayer list, you'll see their name under our missions section. Uh, these are some of our missionaries that your giving here at High School Web Church goes towards supporting in a country where the language of the, the Thai people is tricky, even without sign language. Like just speaking it, the religious dialect is hard to track with, even for native speakers. These are missionaries who have gone in not just to help in that, but to help specifically with the deaf community in one of the most difficult sign languages on the planet. And they are over there in a situation, by the way, if you'll notice a little asterisk by their name if you're here in person, uh, that's not their real name because it is a dangerous enough place where they're doing ministry that their name can't be published in its totality. And so be praying this week for Victor and Madeline Hawthorne, for our International Mission Board missionaries who are making Jesus known in the nation of Thailand. Uh, we also want to be praying for our community. Because as we know, we talked about it last week, we talked about the week before that. The Gospel to Every Home Missions Initiative is starting today. It starts today with On Your Way Out the Door. You'll be able to grab a prayer booklet uh, so that way you can start a 40-day of prayer journey with us. Praying specifically for as we go out in Garrett County and as Baptist churches across Kentucky, take the gospel to every home in the state of Kentucky in 2021 our church included, that we will see people come to know Jesus as their Lord and Savior this year. That's the goal. Y'all were not excited about that. Did y'all know that UK had a ball game yesterday and they won? All right, you're excited about that. We should also be excited about seeing people come to know Jesus as their Lord and Savior. Am I right? 
Yes, and so we want to be praying over that. We believe the Lord works through prayer and through the speaking of his people. So we want to prepare the way for us as we're heading out into our community in the coming months. But, you know, getting that field ready with prayer. So be sure to grab one of those if you'll commit to pray. Over the next 40 days, they'll be available on your way out. And one last opportunity is our Bottles of Blessing giving opportunity to, pro, uh, to help out the Haven Care Center for Expecting Families, uh, just helping these moms be able uh, to, to help support themselves and uh, get service they needed. And so if you uh, haven't grabbed a baby bottle yet, time is ticking, right? JJ, when's the, the deadline on that? March 11th. March 11th. So tick, tick, tick. Be sure to grab that baby bottle today again. Those are available at our exits on the way out. If you're watching online and you want to know something about either one of these things, uh, be sure to drop in the comments. We'll get any information. If you need a baby bottle or a way to uh, get a prayer booklet, we'll get those to you this week. Just let us know you need it. Uh, but with that, I'm going to wrap up announcements and welcome Dan back up here. We are delighted to have uh, Carly Kirkpatrick with us uh, this morning. Glad that she made it in, and she's going to sing a great Corey Asbury song. So let's worship together as she leads us. No 
your shadow, you won't light up. Mountain, you won't climb up. Coming after me. Snow wall, you won't kick down. Lie, you won't tear down. Coming after me. Snow shadow, you won't light up. Mountain, you won't climb up. Coming after me. The snow wall, you won't kick down. No shadow, you won't light up. Mountain, you won't climb up. Coming after me. Slip or you won't kick down. Lie, you won't sit down. Coming after me. No shadow, you won't light up. Mountain, you won't climb up. Coming after me. No. Way to go, Carly. Thank you for coming and singing for us. I love that song. So when I saw you were doing Reckless Love, I was, I was pretty excited myself. So a couple years ago, for our anniversary, Brittany and I thought it'd be a good idea to take a trip through the Deep South, you know, back in the before times when you could go on vacations. And so we went through Alabama and Tennessee, and we ended up planning to where on our anniversary day itself we would go to Pensacola, Florida, at the beach, have some seafood. It was going to be great. I had this big plan figured out. We were going to stay in this historic hotel. Then we were going to go to this fancy restaurant called the Grand Marlin. It was going to be a glorious way to do an anniversary. I was ready. So we leave Alabama, we're heading south, and as soon as we hit the Florida line, it begins to rain. Now, most of y'all have not ridden in a car that I drive. Maybe I'm not the greatest driver in the world. I think I am. My wife does not. And so we're in the rain, in the panhandle, people are all around us, roads are flooding out because it's flat. And the whole time, we're on our anniversary day, and Brittany's gripping the oh no handle, like, you're going to kill us! We get to the hotel, we get checked in, we made it that far, only to find out that this historic hotel that I had planned on was maybe a little creepy, and that historic might have been code word for just kind of old and damp. But we get in there, and I'm like, it's all right, it's all right. There's a holiday end up the road, but it's okay. It's okay. We can do this because we're going to the Grand Marlin. We're going to eat us a fancy seafood dinner. Everything's going to be okay. We get back in the car. Rain's pouring. Thunder. I type in my phone without doing any research to make sure I knew where I was going. I was like, we got this. Grand Marlin. Boop. Let's go. Get in my car, we're driving, rain's coming down, it's dark now, there's lightning flashing everywhere, but it's okay, because I know where I'm going. 
right up until the point I drive past a giant statue of the Blue Angels. And I think, hmm, airplane statue. That's a weird thing for a fish restaurant, but okay. And I keep driving until I get to a checkpoint. And at that checkpoint, a naval officer asks me, Sir, why are you here? <laughs> and that's when I realized I was at Pensacola Naval Air Base, not at the Grand Marlin. And I was like, oh, sir, we're just, we're just from out of town, brother. <laughs> the guy turned around. He was like, I'm going to need you to go over there and park. We'll be over in a minute. And so I pull over to park, and I'm pretty sure I'm headed to jail. All because I thought I knew my way to some seafood. And if we're honest with ourselves, don't we all kind of always think we know what we're talking about? Like, let's talk about that, that Kentucky basketball team. How many of us think we could coach them better than the guys on the sidelines? Kirk Carey does, but I don't know. <laughs> we all do. We'll be sitting there. We're like, that was a dumb call. What are you doing? Pull him out. We do that with everything. We think about it with politics. We watch the news and be like, well, that doofus. Who put them in charge? We do it with everything. We always think we know best. And today, we're going to look at how Jesus is the one who knows best, particularly in our very lives and specifically in our churches. Because sometimes we get that a little twisted around too. But before we get there, I want to recap where we've been. Because if you don't know, this is actually a continuation of a series we've been in before. We started our Luke series actually last year around Christmas time. We were doing, you know, normal Christmas. We talked about baby Jesus in the manger and went through Luke 1, 2, and 3 right there before 2020 had even shown its creepy face talking about the birth of our Lord. And then after we took a pause last winter, we then started back up in the spring in the book of Luke. And we saw specifically in chapter 1, starting in verse 1, that the point of Luke is this. Many have undertaken to compile a narrative about the events that have been fulfilled among us, just as the original eyewitnesses and servants of the word handed it down to us. It also seemed good to me, that's Luke talking, since I have carefully investigated everything from the first, to write to you in an orderly sequence, most honorable Theophilus. Remember our boy Theophilus? We talked about him once upon a time. Luke's going to tell him all about Jesus. Why? Verse 4. And this is the point of the whole book of Luke. So that you may know the certainty of the things about which you have been instructed. The book of Luke is written so that we as Christians can have confidence today in the truth we've been told. Because Luke has gone and done the research to verify exactly who our Jesus is. And so we're going to continue in this series we started last year. We've taken about a year off now. I guess it's time to get back into it and dive back into the book of Luke. We'll be in chapter 6 today. Jesus is just getting started in his ministry and has done a couple miracles. But he's starting to get some beef with these dudes named the Pharisees. And so I'm going to read through it once. We're going to pray and then we'll break it down in a minute. Luke 6, starting in verse 1. On a Sabbath, he passed through the grain fields. His disciples were picking heads of grain, rubbing them in their hands, and eating them. But some of the Pharisees said, Why are you doing what is not lawful on the Sabbath? Jesus answered them, Haven't you read what David and those who were with him did when he was hungry? How he entered the house of God and took and ate the bread of the presence, which is not lawful for any but the priests to eat? He even gave some to those who were with him. And then he told him, and this is a bombshell, the Son of Man is Lord of the Sabbath. What up, Pharisees? Come at me. Verse 6. On another Sabbath, he entered the synagogue and was teaching. A man was there whose right hand was shriveled. The scribes and the Pharisees were watching Jesus closely to see if he would heal on the Sabbath so that they could find a charge against him. But he knew their thoughts and told the man with the shriveled hand, Get up and stand here. And so he got up and stood there, which I guess you do. Then Jesus said to them, I ask you, is it lawful to do good on the Sabbath or to do evil, to save life or to destroy it? 
And after looking around at all, them all, he told him, stretch out your hand. And he did, and his hand was restored, or as the other. They, however, the Pharisees, were filled with rage and started discussing with one another what they might do to Jesus. Let's pray, and then we'll dive in on this word this morning. Father God, I pray today, Lord, help us see that you are the Lord of the Sabbath. You are the Lord of our lives. That you were the one in charge and we are just following you, not deciding what is best for ourselves, not deciding what we think is right, instead letting you take control of that. It's in your name we pray, Lord Jesus. Amen. Our main idea today is this. Jesus is the Lord of the Sabbath and of your life. Jesus is Lord of the Sabbath and of your life. Now let's walk back through this passage and see what's going on. We saw in verse 1 that it was on the Sabbath day. It's on the, the holy day of the week for the Jewish people, the day of rest. And Jesus is passing through some grain fields. Now you got grain growing up all over the place, and his disciples were picking the heads of grain, rubbing it in their hands to open them up, and then they were eating them. Sounds like a pretty chill morning to me. But some of the Pharisees, which you might be like, well, where'd they come from? Odds on, the Pharisees are kind of lurking around watching this group closely because they've already targeted Jesus as a troublemaker. And so they're watching his disciples and him to see what's up with these people. They seem like they might be a little fishy. Let's watch them. And they said, why are you doing what is not lawful on the Sabbath? Now, what they're saying is that by picking the grains off of the plants that they are breaking the sabbath law it's not that actually picking off the grain was illegal in and of itself deuteronomy 23 actually says that in jewish law anyone could walk through somebody else's field and as long as they're not using a scythe or some actual like harvesting equipment they could you know kind of just grab what they needed to eat right then and carry on that's a pretty chill approach to some produce i feel like that could get taken advantage of and yet the Lord had made this set up to where poor people could come and find food at any Jewish field. Someone would be able to get something to eat and not go hungry. And you got to remember, Jesus and his disciples at this point are homeless in and of themselves. They used to have homes, all of them as far as we know, including Jesus back in Capernaum. But they're on the road now. And they didn't have a tour bus to go through the countryside. They're living out on their own, under the stars, eating whatever they can get. And so they've come across this field and they said, hey, yo, we're going to get to have us some oatmeal today. Let's do it. And so they grabbed them up some. That's not the unlawful part. What the Pharisees are saying is that by harvesting grain on the Sabbath day would be unlawful. And again, we go to God's word and we see that's also not the case. That if it's for the, just with your hand, again, not breaking Old Testament law. What they're breaking is the Pharisees' laws. And there's a difference. See, God gave what's in the Old Testament, in the books of the law, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. So that way his people would know how to live holy. And that included certain Things about what they called the Sabbath day, this day of rest, that one day a week, the Jewish people would stop focusing on work and other things in life and instead focus only on the Lord. And so there were certain laws in the Old Testament regarding the Sabbath, what you could do, what you couldn't do. And if you broke any of them, the punishment was death. That's intense. And so understandably, the Jewish people said, well, let's make sure we don't do that. I would like to not die. And so they set up a few other rules, you know, kind of like a guardrail on the highway to keep you from rolling off the cliff and breaking the Sabbath on accident. Well, then what happened is the Pharisees, these religious type people who come up with all these rules, took a few guidelines to help make sure you didn't break the law. And turned it into 39 commandments about you couldn't start a fire. You couldn't walk more than 100 yards. You couldn't this, you couldn't that, including you couldn't pick grain out of the field, even with your hand. 
They basically made it to where all you could do on the Sabbath day is sit there, stare at the ground, and hope that you didn't fall over wrong and die. It's insane. God's word never set up that structure. The Pharisees, the religious leaders of the Jewish people set that up. And so Jesus counters them because clearly they're coming at him. Let's be real. This isn't just like, hey, Jesus, you seem to be good, but all your dudes over there, they're a problem. No, it was clearly targeted at Jesus as the leader of these disciples. And he said, they said, why are you doing what's not lawful on the Sabbath? And Jesus responds, which this is a gangsta move that Jesus does every now and then. He'll be like, haven't you read? He'll be like, oh, you know, haven't you read in your Bible, oh, uh, religious leaders? That'd be like looking up to a preacher today and be like, have you ever read a Bible? I'm sure the Pharisees, every time Jesus did that move, were like, obviously, fam. And yet he goes, haven't you read what David and those who did with him when he was hungry? When he entered the house of God and took and ate the bread of the presence, which is not lawful for any but the priests to eat. What he's talking about is a story from 1 Samuel chapter 21, where David, soon to be King David, was hungry. He was on the run from King Saul. The current king was going to kill him. He'd already been anointed. The next king, you know, the kings don't really get along when one's in charge and one's going to be. That's a not a great relationship. And so David's on the run. Him and his dudes are hungry. And so they went in the temple and they're like, y'all got anything to eat? We're literally going to die if we don't eat something. It's been days. And the priest in the temple said, all we've got is what they call the bread of presence. It was specifically made bread that the priests and the ones working in the temple could eat during holy celebrations. It wasn't meant for everybody to eat. And the Old Testament law was really clear on that. But as we see here, and as we see in 1 Samuel, that not only did David eat the priest's bread, which he was not a priest, but so did all of his crew. That they broke Old Testament law, not Pharisee law, Old Testament law, in this instance, and we see no evidence of them being in the wrong. In fact, Jesus is using this as an example right here of a time when religious practice, even Old Testament religious practice, was put to the side for the sake of someone's life. That when it comes down to it here, it was more important that David and his friends stayed alive than who ate that bread. We'll come back to that in a minute. Jesus then follows that up with, as if that wasn't enough to throw him off, because now he's being like, so if you disagree with David, come at me. And he knows they're not going to do that. He then follows it up by saying, the Son of Man, which he's obviously talking about himself here, the Son of Man is the Lord of the Sabbath. I'm in charge of the Sabbath. Come at me. Uh, I would take it that the Pharisees did not like that approach. And so therefore, in verse 6, it says that on a different Sabbath day, he entered the synagogue and was teaching. And a man was there whose right hand was shriveled up and atrophied. And the scribes and Pharisees were watching him closely. The original language there implies it was like spying. I'm just imagining personally like the Pharisees are over in the bushes like with binoculars. There's that Jesus. He's over there. That's just what I envision. I don't know if they did that. I don't know if they had binoculars, but I like to think they did. They're watching him closely because Jesus is up in the synagogue teaching. It's up in their religious center. He's already on a previous Sabbath question whether or not they read their Bible, whether they know about King David, whether or not they want to disagree with King David, and whether or not he's the Lord of the Sabbath. He's already rubbed them the wrong way about this. And so now they're watching him. They're like, I'm going to see you, Jesus. Dare you. Step out of line. And at this worship service, on the holy day, there's this dude there with a right hand, it says, was shriveled or atrophied, paralyzed. There's actually an old story that he was a stonemason whose hand had been crushed and now he couldn't do his work. I don't know if that's true, but we'll say it is. Got a dude there with a bum hand. Can't work. Can't provide for his family. But he's there worshiping. And they're like, let's see if Jesus will heal this dude. Because if he does, then we could say he's breaking our law again. And that would be twice. Because 
anything that wasn't an emergency, like birth of a child, your legs been chopped off in a wood chipper, I don't know, something bad, that was okay. But if it was like you got a cold, they consider that work on the Sabbath if you tried to get healed from it. And so in this instance, if this dude's hand has been like that, it ain't an emergency. He doesn't need it fixed today. And they could be like, see, Jesus, he's being bad. And so Jesus, verse 8, knew their thoughts. And he told the man with the shriveled hand, get up and stand here. Which I'm sure he was like, uh, okay. So he got up and he stood there. And then Jesus says to them, the Pharisees, the people listening, I ask you, is it lawful to do good on the Sabbath, on the Lord's day, or to do evil? To save life or destroy it? Now, we all know what the right answer is there, right? The Pharisees did too. They didn't hear that and be like, hmm, I don't know, doing evil might be the right move. No, they knew. Jesus was obviously setting them up and being like, hey, if you've got more than two brain cells, you know that, on this, uh, that out of these options, do good is the one you pick. And yet if they run contrary to him doing good after they've agreed to that, gotcha. And so they knew they were stuck. He looks around at them. Obviously, they're not going to say anything because they're like, oh, he got us again. That Jesus. And he tells the man, stretch out your hand. He did, and the hand was restored. They, the Pharisees, however, were filled with rage and started discussing with each other what they might do to Jesus. Because now they're like, no, two Sabbaths in a row. You done showed us up. We're going to get you, bro. Time is coming. So what does all of that have to do with me and you? Because we are not Jewish people in a synagogue with Pharisees on a Sabbath day. I mean, you might be. I don't know. I'm not. What does that mean? Five quick takeaways as we wrap up today. Number one, the Sabbath, Sabbath rest is necessary for us to flourish. You'll notice here what Jesus didn't do. He did not get rid of the Sabbath. He didn't say, well, I, actually, you shouldn't even be doing the Sabbath anyway. Be gone with that. He didn't say that once. All Jesus said was he's the one in charge of the Sabbath and how it gets defined. And the Sabbath, which we see commanded in Exodus 20 and then rules about how to follow through in the rest of the Old Testament, is then fulfilled by Jesus in the New Testament. That if you look in Hebrews chapter 4, it puts it this way. Therefore, since the promise to enter his rest, Christ's rest remains, let us beware that none of you be found to have fallen short. For we also have received the good news just as they did, but the message they heard didn't benefit them, talking about the Jewish people, since they were not united with those who heard it in faith. For we who have believed enter the rest. That if you believe in Jesus Christ, you have entered into the rest, in a sense. That your soul is already healing and resting and restoring through what Jesus has done on the cross. In keeping with what he has said, I swore in my anger they will not enter my rest, even though his works have been finished since the foundation of the world. Jesus has accomplished the Sabbath. We don't have to worry about whether or not we should execute each other if we walk more than so much on the Sabbath day anymore. We're past that. However, I think it's notable that Jesus also never once in the Gospels says don't observe the Sabbath at all. And so therefore, I think there's two principles of it we should take care of. One, the Sabbath is an opportunity to rest. And y'all, in American culture in 2021, rest is not our game. We like to go, 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 go. There is a reason that God put forth the pattern from the creation of the world, six days of work, one day of rest. We as human beings are not meant to go 24-7. We have to find opportunities to rest. That is a gift from the Lord to recharge and renew. If you are not taking rest, find a way. It may not be able to be a whole day right out the gate. We've got crazy lives. But you need to expand on it. 
Your body is not made to go seven days every week, every year. It's just not the pattern of the Bible. Furthermore, part of that rest on the Sabbath day is meant to be found in the communion of the saints with other brothers and sisters together doing what we're doing right now. We are resting in Christ's presence in the gospel together as the body of Christ. That's why we don't do the Sabbath on Saturday anymore. We've moved it to Sunday and renamed it the Lord's Day. It's the day that we together as the body of Christ rest in Christ. That's why this time is so important and why we can't skip it. This is an opportunity for us to fall in line with the biblical pattern of resting in Christ together as God's people. Second, Jesus comes before our practices. We see the Pharisees here were way more worried in these first four verses with their own version of what the Sabbath should look like rather than who is the one in charge of the Sabbath in the first place. They were trying to make Jesus follow their rules rather than making their rules work around Jesus. And y'all, this is a danger for us in churches. It is very easy for us in churches to come up with our practices, our ways of doing things, and then try to fit Jesus into that box. Churches can get so hung up on minor little doctrines or the music style we do or the length of the sermon or the length of the service or the clothes that we wear or blah, 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 blah. None of that is primary over Jesus. When churches are splitting over goofy stuff like that, when churches can't be together in communion with each other over goofy stuff like that, our perspective is wrong. That's why I love what we're able to do in the Garrett County Ministerial Association several times a year and be able to worship together with churches and other denominations. Because here's the thing, Jesus is what is most important. All that other stuff is secondary. We have got to keep that in mind. And not only does Jesus come before our practices, but third, people come before our preferences. People come before our preferences. We see here in Jesus' approach with this poor guy with the shriveled hand that rather than making the Pharisees and the people in the synagogue comfortable, he instead heals this guy out of mercy and compassion. Jesus knew this was going to get people riled up. He was not under the illusion that he was going to heal this dude. Middle of a worship service, by the way. That's a wild way to go about it. Just like middle of a worship service, healing time, let's roll. That'd be fun. But Jesus interrupts it all, creates chaos, makes the Pharisees mad. Why? Because that person's life and his struggle was more important than their preferences. And we as the church of God have got to remember that people, mercy, compassion, love, are more important than our preferences. And this is something I have seen in the last year or so with all of the conflict in our country. We have argued about a pandemic. We have argued about politics. We have argued about race relations in this country. We've argued about a lot of stuff in the last year. And unfortunately, I have seen churches across this country get sucked into that vortex. To where we're arguing with people and we're putting up barriers. And we're saying, I believe this. And if you're a Christian, you should believe this. And da, 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 da. Those are preferences. If it ain't directly in God's word, that's not of God. That's our own preferences. And those are fine. You can have them. But they can't get in the way of loving people. They can't get in the way of the unity of the body of Christ and they can't get in the way of the great commission of going to the lost. And when those divisions and preferences get in the way, they've taken the wrong spot and we're falling in line with the Pharisees. Because number four, Jesus is our Lord and Savior. He makes no bones about it. Verse five, the son of man the one who is the coming Messiah, the one the prophets talked about, the Savior to be, 
He's already calling himself that. And then he says, I'm the Lord of the Sabbath. Well, I already told you who gave him the Sabbath from the beginning. It was God in creation and then in the law of Moses. The, the Lord has already given the Sabbath. And so if Jesus is Lord of the Sabbath, who does that make him? It makes him God. It makes him the Lord not just of the Sabbath. It makes him the Lord of everything. And he's either Lord of everything or he's not. He's either Lord of Sabbath or he's not. And Jesus makes it crystal clear right here that he is not just Lord over one day of the week. He's the Lord over it all because you can't be one and not the other. He's either all God and all Lord and all King and all in charge of our whole lives or he ain't none of it. We don't get to choose. He's not just Lord of Sunday and then Brian gets to run Monday through Saturday. He's either Lord of my life or he's not. That's why verse or part five, our final thing here. Is so crucial. We will respond in faith or we will respond in rage. Look at the two responses in this passage. In verse 8, we see the guy, the shriveled hand, and Jesus says, get up and stand here. So he got up and stood there. He responded in faith. Jesus told him, get over here. And he said, yes, sir. But the Pharisees didn't. Their response in verse 11 was to be filled with rage and start discussing with each other what they might do to Jesus. Y'all, these are the only two options to the gospel. These are the only two options to Jesus. You are either in faith with him or you are in rage against him. The Bible does not provide a middle ground of neutrality. In fact, Jesus points it out right here in this passage. He says, is it lawful to do good on the Sabbath or to do evil? He doesn't say, is it lawful to do nothing? Jesus never in all of the Bible gives nothing as an option on anything. He's very black or white when it comes to following him. You are either on board or you are not. And as we look through scripture, you've got to decide for yourself, you personally, whether you are with Jesus, whether you are following him as your Lord and Savior, or if you are on the side of not neutrality, but evil. There's no in between. You're either with him or you're against him. And when judgment day comes, that's going to be determined. Whether or not you've worked through it yet or not. Now I will tell you. That after the naval officer came over to the car. And scared me to death. He then directed us toward the Grand Marlin. And I followed his directions. And when I got to the restaurant and the server's like, would you like to try the group? Yeah, I'll take your suggestion too, man. I'm just here to listen today. For once, I listen, and then the next day I stopped, and Brittany can attest to that. But we today have to determine whether or not we will listen and trust in Christ or not. If you today have never trusted Christ with your life and with your salvation, today is the day of salvation. Why not right now? How do you do that? Well, it's actually pretty straightforward. It's not easy, but it's straightforward. You admit and acknowledge that you're a sinner, that you are a rebel, that you have sided with evil in your life, that you've not sided with him, but that you believe that he is the Savior and the Lord of all, and therefore you are going to confess him as such in your own life and that you are planning to follow him today. If you do that, you can become a follower of Jesus today. I'd like to talk to you about that. We'll be available in the prayer room during the response time or I'll be up front afterward. Either way, let's have a conversation about you following Jesus, about choosing good over choosing evil. Maybe you've never been baptized before. Trust Christ in your baptism.
Trust Christ enough that you're willing to get before the church and declare yourself as dead to the old you and alive in the new you through Jesus. We can talk about what that means too. Holler at me. I'm available again after service. Or maybe you've not trusted the Lord in church membership. That you've not taken that step to commit yourself to his body as a part of people on mission in community worshiping our God above. Trust Jesus enough to do that. To step forward and team up with a bunch of people who, like I say every week, we ain't perfect. But he is. And we're following after him as close as we can. And if you want to team up with us for that, that takes faith. Step out on it. But we all have a call to respond here as Dan comes and sings. I want to encourage you into a different time today. We're starting a new series. Sun's kind of coming in. I'm just in a mood. During this response time, rather than just getting up and singing, you can do that if you like. But I want to encourage you to come to the Lord in prayer. If you're a believer in Christ today, I want you to trust Jesus by drawing near to him in prayer during this time. If you want to come to the altar, that's fine. If you want to do it right there in your pew, that's fine. If you're at home, you can certainly pray there too. But I want to encourage you to pray about whether or not you are giving Jesus all of your life. If you're giving him all of your preferences and all of your practices. Or if you're still holding on to some of that. And pray about how you could trust him and let go. Let's respond now. Let's stand together. So softly and tenderly Jesus is calling, calling for you and for me. Seeing on the portals he's waiting and watching, watching for you and for me. Come home. Well, thank y'all for being here and being a part of our worship service. Whether you're here in person or you're joining us from a distance, we're glad to worship with you on this beautiful day. If you are here in the house, remember, be careful coming out of the building as you were coming in. Our crew is already out there getting ready to help you get to your car. So we don't want anybody falling and breaking anything on the way out. So y'all be careful and let them help you. That is why they're there. I know some of us are like, I can do it myself. Who you trusting? Throwing that out there. <laughs> Don't get hurt. Uh, remember tonight, 6 o'clock, uh, we'll be on Facebook Live doing our evangelism training. I hope that you'll come and join in with that. We'll talk about how to share our faith uh, a little bit more confidently. Uh, and remember, be sure to grab your baby bottles and your prayer guides on the way out the door. Uh, with that, Tim Daly, would you come and pray for us to close out, brother? Let's pray. Thank you, Heavenly Father, for another day, for your many blessings, Lord. Thank you for being the ruler of all, the one who knows all, Lord. I just thank you for that. Lord, just thank you for watching over the ones that are restoring power to our community, to our state, to our neighboring states, Lord. Just thank you for giving them safety and, and watching over them. Just thank you. Most of all, Lord, for our Jesus, your son, Lord, who died on the cross that we may have everlasting life with thee. All we have to do, Lord, is just truly believe. Just thank you for everything you do for us, Lord. For it's in Jesus' precious name I pray.
Amen.